crime scene investigation, a study of fingerprinting, hair follicles, and our own intuition. I'm Stone. I'm Stephen. And I'm Shiley. Intro. What is forensics? Forensics is any science used for the purposes of law. Therefore, it provides impartial scientific evidence for use in the court of law. What is fingerprinting? The study of fingerprinting is called dactylography. There are three main types of fingerprints, and they can all be identified easily by counting the number of deltas in the fingerprint. A delta, well, delta actually means three, and you can see inside the fingerprint, it's the part where three cards come together from the sides and one from the top. Uh, there, there's the arc, no, the world. The world has two deltas. You can see it right there. You can look at your own fingerprints and try to find it. Uh, there's the loop, which has one, and the arch, which has none. The three forms of visible fingerprints are called are the latent fingerprints, which are invisible, left by the oils around your skin. There are the patent fingerprints, which are kind of like smudges, and then there's the impression. Well, the plastic fingerprints, which if you were to put your finger on a bar of soap, that's what would be left behind. What are hair follicles? Hair follicles are, well, your hair. And the study of hair follicles are called, is called trigology. The main parts of the hair follicles are the cuticle, which can help determine the species of where the hair comes from, the cortex, which helps determine the hair color, and the medulla, which can also help determine species and where the hair, how the person, how the hair fell off. So what we did first was we had to gather our eight participants. Seven were our suspects, and then one was our victim. We had to clean up the computer lab, and then we simulated the crime scene. This was my job. I was the one that knew where the evidence was, who placed the evidence where, and these two were our crime scene investigators. What they do first is they have to take photos and videos from the point of entry. That's where you, where the, you discovered where the culprit first entered. And then we scanned the crime scene for evidence, gathered fingerprint and hair samples from suspects. Those are our known samples, so we know who they belong to. And then we took evidence to the biology lab, and we found out we had to redo our experiment because our latent fingerprints, we couldn't detect with the powder. So what we did was we had the culprit, I had the culprit, put food coloring on her fingers, and they became patent fingerprints rather than latent. And then we compared that evidence to our known samples to declare the culprit. Materials. We used latex gloves, Ziploc baggies, Nerf gun and bullets was the weapon, talcum powder, dissecting microscope, compound light microscope, and food coloring. All right, our independent variables were the types of forensic evidence found at the crime scene. We had fingerprinting, hair analysis, and intuition. Our dependent variables or the effectiveness and methods of analysis of forensic evidence taken from a real-world example, the accuracy of forensic evidences, and which forensic evidence is more effective. And our control variables were the evidence, the location, suspects, temperature, conversation, and materials used to analyze. This is our <laughs> Suspect A Angelica, she was seen in the computer lab just before Andy's death. Suspect B is Theodora, was seen fighting with Andy the morning before her death. Suspect C is Sierra, Andy had stolen Ron away from her. Suspect D is Tiffany, they are study buddies and were seen on multiple occasions in the computer lab. Suspect E is Shayla, she was who reported the crime. Suspect F is Ron, the ex boyfriend. <laughs> Based on our, our experiment, we predicted that 
suspect, B or G, committed the murder based on the motive. That's intuition. Uh, because, because the hair found was long, brown, and curly, we also concluded that the suspect had long, brown, and curly hair. <laughs> which rules out, which rules out the of the suspect. It narrows down their suspect. Um, okay. If the fingerprints on the crime scene match those on the suspect, then they committed the murder. Here's our fingerprint data. Here's the evidence we actually got from our patent fingerprints from the crime scene on the sink. And here are the known samples from our suspects. Here we included suspect D's fingerprints. Here's the hair color participants. We had set up a table to compare the hair colors of our suspects and put their hair colors beneath them, just to further narrow down our suspects and where their hair colors were. Because as you see, we found brown on the crime scene. So that narrows down A, B, um, was that E, F, G, and the victim. She had black hair. We had to make sure it wasn't our victim that we found, but it was actually black. Cool. Here we compare the three types of hair, a blonde sample from suspect E, a brown sample from suspect D, and a black sample from suspect G. And here's our hair analysis data, which further narrows down, narrows, narrow down the, uh, the hair colors of our suspects. Results. Suspect D was the culprit, Tiffany. Multiple suspects had similar hair fibers. <laughs> Fingerprinting is a lot more difficult to find, but it is more accurate than hair fibers because I could have an identical twin and we won't have the same fingerprints. Nobody will ever have the same fingerprints as you, but multiple uh, people can have the same hair fibers, such as if me, Solomon, and Stephen were all suspects in a crime scene, and they found a short, black, curly hair, they can narrow me out of the... <laughs> <laughs> and then intuition will more than likely not give you the answer. Because we assume Theodora or Matthew committed the murder because they had more motive than her study by the Okay, well, there were a lot of limitations to our experiment, uh, the main one was efficiently lifting the fingerprints. It was really hard to get the parts that we needed from the fingerprints that we lifted because what we did was we, we sprinkled powder onto them and lifted them with tape and after we looked at them under a microscope we found out they were good enough. <laughs> so, uh, we, had, we didn't have a completely secluded testing area. Uh, it was open to people to come in and print stuff. So that may have been a very... And then, uh, yeah. how could this be more important to you? Well, if you're, you're on trial and there's three of us, right? And they're accusing me of murdering someone. And this is when they put you on death row, right? You're in jail for the rest of your life. And because they found a hair that looks like mine, they could imprison me. But with fingerprinting, if they check my fingerprints, they can determine that it wasn't me. Same problem. <laughs> All right. Conclusion, our, our, our hypothesis was supported by the evidence found, and this supports in a real-world application. Fingerprinting is sometimes a difficult way of providing evidence, but it still remains the most effective way of proving or disproving evidence. So we found out that even though fingerprinting is the most effective, it takes hair analysis and fingerprinting to truly determine the culprit of the crime. Thank you.